Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I'm going to go ahead and show you guys this clip, the last clip from yesterday's training video, uh, because yeah, I put up the first sets I've done of anything on camera in my new home gym that I'm in the process of building, uh, and I haven't filmed anything in about six months in the gym. It's been close to that mark, I think right at six months. And a lot of people were surprised that I had a belt on because I've oftentimes promoted beltless training. And now that it's there, I think I owe you guys an explanation because it raised a lot of questions. Uh, so historically, I have always promoted people do periods of beltless training. Uh, if you guys recall, even back in the UK, I would do beltless training. And then when I would start peaking for a powerlifting meet, I would put my belt on, right? But I did a lot of my volume training and accumulation work beltless. Uh, I did it beltless, so I would do up to 10 sets of triples without a belt, and even then I would only wear a belt for stuff like the squats, uh, and I didn't wear it for anything else, and I still don't wear it for the deadlift. But, as I started squatting again, because you guys know I not only went beltless training for everything, I took two years off from squatting and two years off from bench pressing, or close to, started doing them again, and decided I need to be well-rounded, all-around strength base, and so I'm doing a variety of lifts and deciding that I need to be very strong at every basic movement pattern. Now, I've got a ways to go to reach those goals, but I put a belt back on, uh, and I waited till I got my pause squat back up to 405 without a belt. When I held 405 for about a two to three second hold at the bottom, paused, and then did a squat with that, I said, okay, it's time to belt back up. Uh, and a lot of people said, hey, you know, you respect Greg Knuckles. He always talks about this. Why don't you wear a belt? And there's two people who influenced me to wear belts, and that's going to be Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum and Greg Knuckles. The reason I listened to these guys is multifolded nature. Uh, number one, they're very strong lifters themselves. Both of these guys are currently, granted they're younger than me, but they are currently stronger than me on pretty much most of their lifts, if not all of them. Both of these guys are. They're both knowledgeable strength coaches, right? They're both very knowledgeable strength coaches. Uh, they both have advanced degrees in either medical or sports sciences. And these are two individuals who I consider to be very knowledgeable when it comes to strength training. Uh, these are individuals who, when they make a statement, I'm not willing to dismiss it outright. Their status and their success alone and their knowledge of these two guys are guys that when they make a statement, I might not agree with it, but I'm damn sure going to listen. I'm going to analyze it and see if it's useful to me. If it's something that's different than what I do or what I believe in, um, I'm going to take it seriously under serious consideration. Both of these guys have created between the two of them very reasonable arguments for using a belt for a significant amount of your strength training. Uh, so for me, I use it on two lifts. I use the belt on two lifts right now, the standing press and the squat. I do not deadlift, row, bench, any of that stuff with a belt. Now the argument they create, uh, I disagree with the one about the EMG studies. I don't think the EMG studies, and I'm not going to get into all that, are legitimate. I don't think they're worth consideration. Uh, I don't think there's enough useful data there. But the point that they make in the observations of their athletes and people they've coached over the years and their knowledge of sports sciences is that belts seem to enhance neuromuscular efficiency thus allowing you to lift more weight and create more overload in things like your arms, your shoulders, your legs, your glutes, all these muscles uh, because of the intra-abdominal pressure. That it's not cheating in the same way that using a wrap is or a slingshot because that's external objects. And people say, oh, it helps you overload. No, it doesn't. Those don't help you overload because it's an external force helping you lift the weight. And if there's an external force helping you lift the weight, it's not your muscles and therefore you are not getting a growth response from the extra weight, right? That should be common sense. The belts enhance neuromuscular efficiency by allowing the core to brace because it's partially that ripple effect that we talk about. Uh, again, I, if you guys remember someone who used to write about this a lot was Pavel Talsaline would talk about that. The bracing your core or gripping a weight harder seems to allow you to be stronger. And it's because of, again, a radiant effect or a ripple effect through the body of when one muscle gets contracted hard, 
other muscles are able to contract hard as well. So you have that component of it. You have the fact that it allows you to keep a little more upright with less effort being put into that and therefore more effort can be focused into driving the weight harder. So what this does, it does allow for a stronger contraction. Stronger contraction equals more muscle fiber recruitment, more force produced, therefore more size and strength potential from a given lift or a given set. Uh, it's not dramatically more, but it's a small amount more. But if we're trying to squeeze every inch of gains that we can, there's a logic to that. Now, a lot of times we could argue, well, is it any different than doing any other max effort? And isn't that going to affect recovery? And that's been my concern uh, with that also, is that is it affecting recovery? Is it going to make my core weak in the long term? And again, we go back to the point of what they have noticed, in particular Dr. Jordan has noticed, is that he can have athletes do more total training volume with a belt and still recover. Now, that's interesting because when we start talking about axial loading, that's something I talk to you guys about a lot of recovery issues from axial loading because I believe axial loading exercises, exercises that compress the spine, are generally superior in their ability to produce size and strength and even produce overall athleticism. They're superior exercises. However, as the weight goes up, you get more axial loading and therefore recovery could be a problem. And this is why I'll say sometimes front squats are deficit deadlifts can be a way to slightly reduce axial loading while stimulating similar amounts of muscle mass in, in the muscles you're trying to work. So these are tools we'll use, and this is one reason I am not a fan of heavy partials on any axial loading exercise. Not only are partials inferior, you're now cutting deeper into your recovery ability. So I would never have anyone do a heavy rack pull on top of the fact that it's more of a partial than the deadlift already is. The additional axial loading. Well, the belt itself has the potential to reduce axial loading with any given amount of weight because again the intra-abdominal pressure helps keep the spine more upright hypothetically uh, at least through the lumbar region of the spine you may get less compression of the spine therefore the axial loading may be reduced and that's what he's noted is that he can put more volume into uh, things like his squats deadlifts overhead pressing for his athletes before they overreach well again if we can get a stronger muscle contraction through more overload and it puts less stress in terms of axial loading stress and systematic stress instead of more then we can do more work, lift slightly heavier, and recover slightly easier from it. That's a win all the way around. Uh, that's a big deal. And the thing is, I've noticed historically, what is it that I always do? I used to do volume accumulation work, tons and tons of triples every week, beltless, pause, all that stuff, until they started to become a recovery issue, then I used to belt up. And the argument I used to make there is obviously at a certain threshold, um, your abs are giving out on your training, you start getting more and more backgrounding and then your overall fatigue goes up and you can't do as much volume each week. Because I used to do like up to 10 sets of three, three times a week on the squat in the off season. Uh, and then I would go into a Bulgarian style. If you guys recall uh, how I did that uh, back before my last meet in the UK, uh, that's how I did it. But eventually I would have to belt up. You know, I would run something like six weeks of straight accumulation work uh, of every time I could get 10 sets of three with a pause, beltless, I would add five pounds and then try to get 10 sets of three three times a week. Well, eventually the core would start to become a weak link with the volume and more backgrounding happened. And so that I, that's where was my sign when I needed to belt up at a certain threshold. So there may be something to that. So these guys do know what they're talking about and I'm doing that, but I want to reiterate that point. I also went two years without wearing a belt. I've also been doing triples with like 550 on the deadlift beltless. Uh, I got my strict standing press to 200 without a belt before I put a belt on. I got my pause squat uh, without a belt up to 405 before I put a belt back on. So I built at least a, a base again on those exercises uh, to the point to where I had a base again, a beltless base. And that's what I would still advise a lot of people to do. Most of you out there aren't strong enough that your training load is going to be a problem. Uh, so go ahead and build a base without a belt. And I think there's still some merit to incorporating a little bit of beltless training every year. I think there is something to that. 
Uh, and remember, you use the belt on the exercises where you really need it on exercises that produce a lot of axial loading that you're going to do a lot of volume or with very heavy weights. Um, I'm not telling anyone that they should be wearing a belt for a row <laughs> or a lateral raise or anything else. If you're doing it for this stuff, that we're just getting ridiculous at that point. But things like squats and, and deadlifts, if you're comfortable with it, I choose to deadlift without a belt. Uh, your standing presses, things like that, there may be some merit to this, particularly if you're trying to maximize workload, maximize weight moved, and control the amount of axial loading you're subjected to and you've built a strength base there could be some merit to that and so that's what i'm doing but belted training isn't something i think you need to be doing from the get-go i will still stand by that and you don't need to be wearing a belt for curls lateral raises rows or any of that that's just getting that's getting to the point of ridiculousness all right guys but that's really all i have to say on that today i hope it's been informative and i will talk to you guys next time